All right, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Kim Elena Ionescu. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Specialty Coffee Association, and I will be kicking off this webinar today. It's a webinar on the membership survey on sustainability that the SCA conducted about a year ago. And joining me for this webinar is um, the esteemed Samantha Vade. Uh, I'll let her introduce herself, and then um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how this webinar or how this survey rather was conducted and uh, and her role in that. So, Sam? Great, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone, depending I guess where you are in the world. Um, happy to be here, so um, just a little bit about my background. Um, I have a feeling for those of you on the phone, I've probably worked with some of you. Um, I have been in the coffee industry for uh, over two decades now. Um, spent a lot of my time in learning and development, um, and over the last uh, 10 years have really transitioned my role into sustainability. So worked um, for a long time on the SCAA Sustainability Council. Um, was very lucky to, to have spent quite a bit of volunteer time with that crowd. Um, I also um, was the sustainability director at the coffee and tea division of Mars Incorporated and then um, left that and for the last year have been doing um, some consulting work, uh, working with organizations that um, both for-profit and non-profit that are really looking to make a positive difference in the world. And, and through that was able to do some work with the SCA on this membership survey. Um, and recently just joined as the uh, Associate Director of the U.S. Operations for a uh, nonprofit um, group called Forum for the Future that's really looking to drive systemic change to address um, deep embedded sustainability challenges. So I'm super glad to be here today. I, I have quite a passion for the SCA and um, I'm delighted to share this information. Great. Thank you, Sam. That's a good bio. And uh, so in terms of this particular project, a lot of the work that you'll see in the slides is actually Sam's work because um, she did a lot of the, the analysis of the data that we collected in this, um, in this survey. Uh, so next slide, please. But let's talk a little bit about the, um, you know, the survey itself. So the purpose of this survey was to um, to gain insight. I'll just read this slide. I know that's bad practice, but it's not very much. So to gain insight into SEA member perceptions of sustainability in their organizations, the association, and the specialty coffee industry. So, um, you know, we uh, we did the survey because we knew <laughs> from prior surveys that we'd done, like uh, for example, the SEAA, the Heritage American Association, did a survey every three years of members and. Um, in the more recent surveys, we'd found that sustainability ranked very highly among members as a source of value from the association and an area where they wanted to see leadership from the association. But, you know, what we never did in those surveys was to ask any follow-up questions about how that was interpreted or what it, um, how it was being defined by members, what kind of leadership they wanted to see. And, you know, we knew that there were obviously a lot of different definitions and interpretations out there, a lot of ways to um, to pursue sustainability and that those could really be different depending on where in the world you are or the coffee value chain or, you know, your age role in the supply chain. So um, so we wanted to, to ask more questions about, um, about sustainability. Uh, next slide. All right, so the scope of the survey um, was uh, that was something that you know was also inspired by the unification of the American and European associations, um, because we had this knowledge that uh, sustainability was important, but not so much more than that. We used the opportunity of the unification of the associations um, on January first of twenty seventeen as a, a chance to you know set this new baseline. So we sent out a survey to all of the member uh, contact addre email addresses that we had. Um, and between January 27th, uh, 2017 and March 1st, we collected uh, 200 and 602 uh, responses from, um, from within that, that membership group that we sent the email to. Um, next slide. 
And, um, and this slide just shows you a breakdown by membership category of how people responded. So these categories do con conform to categories of membership within SEA. And, um, you know, it's not an exact, this was not, we didn't approach this survey looking for a representative sample where all of the percentages here would correspond to the, you know, membership percentages um, that we have. So. You know, there may be some categories that are overrepresented and some that are underrepresented as a proportion of our total members. But I will also say that, you know, this isn't this isn't bad. Roasters and baristas are um, are very actively uh, represented or a lot of the responses came from those two uh, two groups. And those are very two very strong constituencies within our um, within our membership. Um, next slide. Um, so that's a, a little bit of the just the overview of who we surveyed and how we how we did it. Um, so now I want to get into a few of the the highlights, things that um, both Sam and I, in talking about this survey uh, a few months ago when she completed the work, and then um, and then in the months since, feel like are uh, are especially interesting or things that we'd like to go into a little bit more detail on and um, and and consider with you all. Um, and so one of those highlights that, that struck out, stuck out to me immediately was that 62% of the respondents say that they have someone designated in their organization to address sustainability. Next slide. So, um, you know, this is a, this is a really interesting question, uh, an, an interesting one for me and an interesting answer because, um, it surprised me to see such a high percentage of, uh, of people, of companies, organizations saying that they had someone in that, um, in that position. But, you know, we don't know a lot more than that because it was a, a yes or no question. You know, do you have this or don't you? And there wasn't a, a place to follow up and describe that role. So Sam, I'd love to hear from you um, whether or not that number surprised you or if it was just me. And also, um, how important do you think it is to have that definition of roles? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, Kim, I, I think when you and I first talk, talked about this, we were both really heartened by this. And in sharing this with some of the other members of the Sustainability Center, they were heartened by this as well. And, um, um, and, and without... Uh, um, you know, mitigating that excitement, I do think there's some notes of caution on this. So um, one of the, the um, things that I think we have to consider is that without a universal kind of agreed upon definition of sustainability or, you know, resources dedicated to sustainability, it's hard to really understand, you know, what, what does it mean to say that you have someone um, dedicated to sustainability in your organization? So, um, you know, for example, someone might have answered yes on this um, survey, and that person that is designated in their organization could be that, you know, passionate part-time barista that volunteered to really take this on for their cafe and and um, maybe investigate uh, composting options. And, and, you know, that is a check mark for yes. Um, and there also might be someone who checked yes, who has a fully resourced um, chief sustainability officer. Um, so I think it is definitely uh, heartening, um, but uh, as we have talked about, uh, it's one of those that I would love to dig into more to find out what exactly does that mean? What are the levels of that role? What are the job responsibilities that, that um, ladder up to that resource? Um, yeah, to kind of dig into it a little bit more. So again, super encouraging, but this is definitely one where I think you'll agree we, we want more information. Yeah, and to me, this is a great example of one of those um, questions that I think the answer would have been very different 10 years ago, um, uh, or even maybe five years ago. So the fact that this number surprised me is a good thing, but, um, but if we really do have such a high percentage of uh, members or respondents um, saying that they have someone in this role, then we should probably know for next time to ask a few more questions about that, uh, about what that role is or these roles are. And also it's a good um, opportunity to note also that the, uh, the survey probably did attract more people as respondents who have an interest in sustainability or might be that person themselves. That was another um, you know, question about the role of the, um, about the, 
you know, the role of the respondent. And we didn't um, we didn't ask them whether they were both a roaster and a chief sustainability officer at the same time. So uh, so we probably are skewed toward more organizations that have a sustainability person who might be more invested in in responding to a sustainability survey than an organization that doesn't have someone in that role. Um, but anyway, yeah. interesting regardless. Yeah, and I think one um, of the things that would be interesting for us to look into at some point is how does this benchmark against other industries? Right. So so if we um, when we do 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 dig into this, um, you know, is a 62 percent kind of common across maybe other organizations that also deal with, you know, tropical commodity supply chains or are we ahead of the curve behind the curve? So really, um, I think like a good survey does, this provided us with good information, um, but then opportunities for further research. That's a great point. I was tempted to, uh, to write that down, but then I thought, no, I'll just go back and I can watch the recording. <laughs> Um, all right, next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to note the uh, the most important sustainability areas for um, for the organization. So that's a question that we asked, you know, and, and we gave people multiple choice answers. What are the um, what are the or in which of the following areas is your organization's work in sustainability the most successful or the most um, important? And so um, the uh, the, or actually this was an open-ended question. And, um, and the way that we created these categories was to have a group of volunteers go through and form, um, uh, identify similar responses and try to create some sort of um, category out of that. Because uh, when we designed the survey, we wanted to give people who wanted to tell us what they were doing, ample opportunities to do so. And so not make everything a yes or no question like the one that we just looked at and not make everything um, conform to the categories that we already work in or or would identify ourselves as the SCA because um, like I said at the at the beginning of the webinar um, we wanted to hear from people in an area where we knew that we have a lot of interest and hadn't asked a lot of questions in the past so we um, you know, we created these sort of general categories, and um, and one thing that I think is uh, is interesting here is that while environmentally friendly business practices are is the largest, um, the most popular response, the category that has the most responses in it, um, it's still you know 19.8 percent. It's still pretty, uh, it's less than 20 percent, and there are so many different colors in this pie chart here, um, and that to me is a representation of like the number of different interpretations of sustainability there are um, even within these 602, uh, 602 respondents. Um, Sam, I'm interested to hear from you if there is, if anything on this slide surprises you and also if there's anything that's, um, that you feel like is missing from this uh, colorful wheel. Yeah, I, and this is one of those that if there are, um, you know, from folks on the phone, I, I am curious to hear their responses as well, right? So for someone like uh, myself or yourself who who live and breathe this, I, I think this pie chart did not surprise me. And I think what didn't surprise me is, again, the sheer diversity of um, items that get folded into sustainability in a lot of organizations. But um, there might be folks on the phone who this isn't their full-time you know, isn't what they um, wake up thinking about and go to bed thinking about. So it'd be interesting to hear their thoughts. But I think that a couple things that were uh, definitely came out for me. So one is um, not just the diversity of definition in sustainability, but how that diversity actually manifests. So, for example, um, some folks are looking at you know climate change adaptation and coffee growing regions that's a very um i think most of us uh, agree and and would not argue with that fitting under the banner of sustainability um, but then you see this rather large chunk of the pie which is creating a fair and equitable work environment in your workplace and I, I do think we see more and more that um under the banner of sustainability or corporate social responsibility um, a, a wider definition where folks are looking at things like employee pr um, professional development or learning and development or um, worker safety in their factories, let's say, as part of sustainability. But um, that is something that I think some folks might argue is not traditional sustainability. Um, so I think for, for this pie, what was interesting to me is, again, this 
this ongoing tension between um, wanting to um, define sustainability and what does sustainability mean and of course the dangers of defining something because you will inevitably leave something out. Um, so, so I, I mean, that was what was interesting to me on, on here again is this, you know, when we talk about sustainability in the industry, does, for example, worker safety fall into that or do we need to define what is sustainability in our industry more narrowly just so that we have a common language? Um, and then I think there's also, there's probably some things embedded in here that don't look like they're represented um, that I would be interested in finding out. For example, what is social justice? You know, what are folks including in this 10.2% around social justice? Um, you know, is that, um, you know, gender equity, uh, gender justice, is this more um, uh, labor rights, um, unions? I mean, so, uh, again, a, a really interesting pie, but one that brings up, I think, some interesting, um, interesting questions for future investigation. Oops, I muted myself. Yes, it is. Uh, I think there is definitely a lot of, uh, of opportunity for future investigation. Um, and I wanted to remind everyone that uh, that they can submit their questions or by raising their and, and do that over audio by raising your hand on the um, on the GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, I've gotten a couple questions. Uh, that I'll, I'll pause to answer before um, before moving on. So one question from Nicole Hark is um, of the 602 respondents, were some from multiple were some from the same organization, or are they separate? And um, and that's a you know that's a great question. And and I mentioned that we sent this to our member email contacts, and um, so it is possible that there is duplication from the same organization. Um, and uh, and obviously that's not what that's not ideal. But we also weighed the benefits of um, and drawbacks of sending it only to the uh, the sustainability officers that we knew, or um, or to the sort of the lead member contact for any organization. And we knew that that might not be the person who is the in the best position to answer the questions, or even that um, that if it was an organization where someone else wanted to answer the questions that would make it to them. So we made the decision to send it to everyone and um, in this kind of information gathering, uh, with this information gathering goal and in the future to refine that a little bit more and um, potentially if we can get a better sense of who these um, these sustainability contacts are, for example, that they might, um, we might send them different questions in the future. Um, Hank asked, was this an open question about the most sustainability, most uh, important sustainability areas, I presume? And, um, and the, in this particular area, we did, um, this was a, a multiple choice question. And we asked people um, these, we defined these categories or we came up with this uh, out of a combination of surveys that had been done by SCAA and SCAE in 2016. So both heritage associations had conducted member surveys in a uh, much sort of smaller scale at the major events they'd done. Uh, in the United States, there was a sustainability survey that was done at, um, at Expo in Atlanta and in um, Europe at the World of Coffee show in Dublin and there was some overlap between the questions that were asked there and some unique questions so we used those two surveys as the backbone for um, for what we did here and then finally um, Maria Esther Lopez comments it's interesting that climate change adaptation in coffee growing regions is only 2.8 percent um, I think that all the different margins are affected by this factor um, yes I uh, I personally I agree with you I think that um, that uh, this is something that you know. Whenever we talk about uh, sustainability of production, that um, that all of us who are further along the value chain are affected by the viability of um, of production and by the challenges and the vulnerabilities in in production. And the fact that that doesn't rank higher might have to do with who is answering this question um, and where they see themselves as having a a greater impact, you know, if they're if they are that passionate night shift barista that um, that Sam referred to earlier, um, and I think that also again speaks to the many different interpretations of sustainability activity that fall currently fall under 
um, or that we see within our industry community. And, uh, and to build off of what Sam was just talking about, in the future to be able to separate those, the activities that are about, you know, climate change adaptation in coffee growing regions and, um, and the efforts that a business makes to be a better employer of, um, of baristas or member of its local community through its, um, its support of local charities, that those, that if we can, you know, create some different language or some, some categories there, um, it might help us to, um, to differentiate and to be more effective in both of those areas. And, and just one um, element to add to that, I also, you know, as I look at this, I think, um, for example, if I were to take the survey today um, and, and think about the last organization that I worked for, you know, I would have ticked maintaining the long-term viability of the world's coffee supply, but then the way in which I, you know, I would, encourage the business to go about doing that is through environmentally friendly practices and climate change adaptation in coffee growing regions and and figuring out ways to create a um, you know a, uh, a more um, economic viability on farms and so you know there's also um, uh, though, though I agree that climate change adaptation at only 2.8 percent is uh, notable and, and perhaps a little alarming it might be embedded, you know, in some of these these other answers as well. All right, um, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, another uh, highlight from the study is um, how people identified the greatest threat to the sector. Um, so here it says 29% of respondents identified climate change as the sector's biggest threat, followed by labor concerns and a lack of next generation farmers. Next slide. Okay, so here you can see the graph that corresponds to that question. Um, and uh, so with this response, I mean, Again, my I, I was not surprised to see climate change rank so highly, um, not only because we know that it's affecting coffee, but because we talk about this so much um, at the geopolitical level. You know, climate change is a really, um, it's an issue that even if we are not doing a lot about it at our personal or, you know, at national scale, that uh, we certainly talk a lot about it and recognize this as a major global, um, global challenge. Um, but I was uh, I was more surprised to see the uh, the low pay, insufficient labor rights, um, labor shortages category um, come up at the in the second place for the biggest threat. And um, Sam, I you know I'd love to hear from you what you think about these um, about these uh, these categories. <clears throat> yeah, and and Kim, as you remember, this is one of the the slides that when we presented this to the sustainability center um, as part of the SCA, we had a we had a lot of conversation on this slide. And um, for those of you that have been attending some of the SCA events over the last couple of years, you might have noticed that a lot of the work that the sustainability center has been doing are around some prioritized areas of sustainability. And they correlate with what shows up on this map as um, what uh, the membership sees as the biggest threats. And um, that a little bit of chicken or the egg here, right? So um, one of my questions um, is, did the SCA Sustainability Center in choosing to focus on climate change, um, labor rights, and farmer profitability, um, did did we just identify the right areas of focus in the sector? So we were, were our fingers really on the pulse of what was important to the membership, or in choosing those and really beginning to talk about those and amplify our concerns, did our did the membership kind of hear that and then hear that wow these are the things that I'm hearing in the industry are the biggest threat? Um, I think they're a big threat too. So I think it, it's just, I think both are fine, um, but I do think it is 
potentially influences how the sustainability center selects what they focus on going forward, right? Are we trying to identify what membership sees as important and then educate and, and amplify and communicate about those? Or do we, do we as the sustainability center want to do our own kind of investigation, identify what we think is important and then raise the awareness of those? So, um, just uh, you know, definitely interesting for today, but again, as the Sustainability Center goes forward, I think some interesting questions about focus areas for the future. Um, the other piece that I think is interesting in here, and I think when we deal with something like sustainability that is so broad and systemic, this will always be the challenge, is that some of these are inter in, um, have a lot of interdependencies, right? So I, I, again, I remember when we were talking to the Sustainability Center, um, there was a really strong opinion that lack of next generation of farmers is because of climate change and because of the volatility in the markets and because um, the low pay is not, you know, does not make for a very desirable, um, quote unquote, career path for your children, let's say. So, um, you know, is the lack of generation, uh, lack of next generation farmers a threat in and of itself? Sure, but if by addressing some of these other challenges, might we be more likely to draw folks back into coffee and to do so in a more responsible way, right? So we're drawing folks into a um, path that is going to be secure and abundant um, and not not high risk, so. Yeah, yeah, I wanna to respond to a couple of things that you just said, Sam, but, um, but also I think there's a good tie into a question we got from Andrew Timko about what uh, the systemic components within the coffee industry are that work against sustain sustainability. And one thing that, um, that I think works against sustainability in the coffee industry and, um, and maybe everywhere is, um, is that interrelationship between all of these threats so that it's not really possible to effectively address any of them in isolation. And um, and that makes it difficult to to see or to feel like you you're really done ever like you know oh we're gonna you know okay climate change that's the biggest threat let's tackle climate change and then you know you start to do that and and maybe the most obvious way to do it is something related to the um, the plant you know the coffee plant itself but then you realize that oh gosh the coffee plant you know we don't have we, why don't we have more genetic diversity to draw on or why haven't we invested more in research and development as an industry. And then you think oh, we're gonna we should do that we should invest more and then you go out and try to get people to invest more and then you realize that there are all of these other issues um related to why that hasn't happened to date and then there are um there's not a dissemination network and uh the problems or the the scale of the challenge can get bigger and bigger and there are more factors to consider and so um all of a sudden you know you start with one and then you end up feeling like um, well, in order to really effectively address climate change, you've got to make sure we have a next generation of farmers. And um, and where are the economic resources that these next generation of farmers are going to be using to implement these better agricultural practices? Like we've got to figure out the um, the stability of uh, of the you know the the market and the um, the economic you know the profitability of the farm. So um, and and farm profitability in order to have a profitable farm you have to have a, a stable labor source and labor is up or upwards of 50 percent of a farm's production cost so you got to deal with labor so it's just there's they're all related and that's um that's a fascinating thing i mean i, I don't think that's a bad thing i just think that that's um that's really a, a big part of why um why it's not easier or why it feels like we're not making maybe as much progress as um, we would like to think we could make as an industry because the problems are, are more complex than um, than we're used to dealing with. Um, but another thing, Sam, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say another thing that I wanted to um, to uh, to highlight that in, in what you said was that I, I agree with you that it's really sort of a, a fascinating chicken and egg um, dynamic here uh, with the. The issues that we focused on, because if we, um, you know, if we look to our members and say, "What do you all like think is most important?" Then, um, judging from this, it's kind of a mandate to keep going, like climate change. We need to talk more about that, and uh, and labor rights, labor shortages. That's we should need to keep talking about that too, because these are the biggest issues, and you know, we think so. 
and the members think so too. <laughs> so like this is, you know, this is what we should be doing. But but, um, but if we do interpret it like we have um, we have effectively raised awareness um, on an issue like uh, labor rights and labor shortages um, in the past two and a half years, then um, and that leads me to think like where we could what we could do if we focused elsewhere and uh, and it highlights to me the need to continue to explore other issues to um to you know fill in the gaps in that uh that complex picture yeah, yeah and just i um i agree and i don't i don't know what the answer is to that and and i think we'll get to this a little bit when we we get into what is the specific role of the sca you know and what does membership want to see out of the sca and and um helping respond to some of these broad systemic challenges um i do think just one point that i i want to build on um your point kim about how these are so interrelated and and it, I, again kind of like a you know a web or something you pull one part of it and um you know the whole you, you realize it's connected to um many different issues is um and SCA has been a huge advocate of this is the importance of collaboration and really um, working cross industry because you know most of the organizations or maybe all of the organizations that we on the phone represent are not going to be able to tackle these um, on our own and and it does re result in duplication of efforts in some areas and gaps and, and others and lack of understanding of where there is interdependencies and and um, of course this is I, I don't know what the overall solution is but um, the the uh, phrase that always um, comes up to me is the pathological collaboration that came up at a SCAA event um, several years ago. But I don't know 100% what that looks like, but I do think given these interdependencies and given the scale of what's showing up on the screen right now, it's the um, best chance we have of, of making a difference and moving the needle in these areas. Yeah. Well, that's a, you mentioned the, um, the role of the SCA, so that's a good segue into the next slide. <clears throat> All right. Um, so when we asked um, the survey respondents about the role of the SCA, 44.45% uh, of respondents say that the SCA's role in sustainability is informing and educating. Next slide. So here's what this pie chart looks like. And this is an area where um, we actually didn't give um, categories, unlike the um, the slide that, that someone asked about, maybe two back about uh, how an organization demonstrates its commitment to sustainability. This one, um, we we gave it, you know, it was an open-ended, open response. And um, we went through and we categorized the, the responses and uh, and tried to find common, common ground between them, um, between the way that people responded to this. And what we found was that, um, you know, overwhelmingly people, identified that the SCA's role was to educate and inform, um, but that there was a, an interesting um, divide between whether or not the, who the audience was, whether our role would be to educate and inform industry or to educate and inform um, consumers. Uh, and it's almost equally divided, which I find really interesting. Um, and then one other note is that, you know, we, um, we, and, made the decision to uh, to say educate slash inform because a lot of people um, identify, you know, education, we need more education, the SEA needs to educate. Um, and of course, we have an education program, we have a coffee skills program, and that's how we often refer to uh, education internally and with to our members. But I think to, um, to many people who engage with the SEA who maybe have never taken a, a class through the coffee skills program, education is, is the papers and articles that we write and the lectures that they attend at Expo and the, um, you know, the videos from past RICO symposium talks that they watch online, all of that is, uh, is, is education for them about, um, about coffee and about these, uh, the coffee beyond the boundaries of, um, of their particular role. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to just to clarify that as to why we're saying educate and inform, because those can be those can be different things, but we're kind of a, it's a broad category when we say it here. Um, but uh, 
Sam, I would love to uh, to hear from you. You know, what do you think about um, about this kind of education mandate? And then uh, and then also, what about all those other categories? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, and I know I'm in a slightly different position now, but uh, when when I was um, heading the SCAA Sustainability Council. Um, with that lens, this this is a daunting list, right? So um, I think all of these are incredibly important and they're all um, areas that membership, we as membership need support in. But when I think about um, SCA, which is a nonprofit, membership-based, mostly volunteer-driven organization, um, you know, the scope of what um, SCA can take on it is is limited um and so uh you know I, I know you and i talked about this but how do we look at this list and figure out what we as scaa or as sca and whether you're on staff or a member or a vol you know just an occasional volunteer what can we do that that we are best placed to do and then how do we maybe get creative to help our membership meet some of these other needs even if it's not directly through SCA, um, you know, is there some creative collaborations out there? Are there some, um, you know, ways to link arms and do some joint membership kind of thinking with some other organizations? Um, uh, I don't know, but I, I do think that what is encouraging here is, um, and you and I have talked about this, is that SCA is uniquely positioned given its scale and, and its membership base to do education and, and um, uh, uh, communication efforts, right? And maybe as part of that education communication efforts, um, we can focus on, well, if we can't do a ton of advocacy, let's say, um, then how do we support our membership to get those needs met in some other ways? So um, I think this is, uh, Definitely something for um, you know us to talk about is beyond education information. What are the areas that we want to engage in, and then the areas that we can't? How do we maybe uh, look to see to still ensure that those needs are met? I do think one of the things I want to pull out on here that I think is interesting is this: educate and inform customers versus educate and inform the industry as well. Um, and you know, when you look at this, the educate and inform customers edges out a little bit the educate and inform the industry. And um, was thinking, in fact, over my coffee this morning a little bit, like how do we tackle that, right? Because the SCA um, audience is the industry; it's not customers, right? So if we go to um, the event coming up in Seattle, the chance that consumers are going to be there, or a large number of those, is 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 limited. So, you know, is there a way that we use our ability to educate and inform the industry to help the industry maybe better educate and inform their audience and their audience are customers? So, you know, it might be um, less that we have a direct influence on customers, but, you know, maybe we can help crack this nut on how to communicate to consumers the value of supporting sustainability. And, um you know, having been in marketing and learning and education, and it is something that that I find fascinating. We have not cracked the nut. We have not figured out how to convey to customers, on a, I think on a broad scale, why you need to value sustainability and why it's worth paying more for and why it's worth asking the tough questions about. So. Yeah, I think that's, a um, you know, what I hear you uh, saying and speaking from your experience that to say that this is difficult is that um, I wonder if many people feel like I am like I'm stuck. I am not getting anywhere doing this on my own. You know, maybe if I can't get my customers to change their behavior, maybe the SCA can. Um, and, and like you, I think that there's a, an enormous amount that we can do to um, to support that to support those efforts. Um, and you know, uh, one of the comments here that we got or one of the questions is uh, from Joanne Sonnenschein saying, seems like a great opportunity to pull together those that are able to help your members deliver on those priorities. Monthly brown bags, presentations, resource provisions, a lot of organizations out there can help. Um, and I could not agree more. I'm so glad for the, um, for the partnership opportunities that we have, uh, you know, 
as the SCA, we do things like uh, annually give an award to a sustainable business model and a sustainable project because a lot of this leadership that we're talking about and, and a lot of these new ideas are being um, are being explored and uh, and pioneered by members of the association or even, you know, I, I say members of the association, but um, members, people within the industry community. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think that leadership can take a lot of different forms and that um, sometimes because of the nature of this association and because of all of the different um, ideas, say, or uh, organizations that we represent, then uh, we can be a better leader when we can direct, infer, you know, direct a question or direct um, a, a someone who's interested, I don't know, in, to another organization to um, to really amplify someone else's efforts as opposed to trying to become the be all, end all, do all organization for every need for every member um, of the uh, of the specialty coffee industry. Um, and another question or comment that we got is uh, from Andrew Timko. The, I think the influence SCA has on the direction of research can't be understated. Um, I agree. You know, Sam is actually a member of the uh, the advisory council to the research center, which um, you know works closely with the sustainability center. And in fact, this presentation is a great example of sustainability research that we have done. Um, but I, you know, I think that the the SCA's influence. Um, and it's in here, I think maybe represented as advocate or uh, there are ways that it may be difficult to find the the right verb for it. Um, but that combination of, of advocacy or influence um, using the, the kind of aspirational um, nature of specialty coffee and what it means to have coffee that tastes better and coffee that um, that represents something that is differentiated and, uh, you know, not to use the word that's in the organization title, but special, um, does come with, uh, with influence and opportunity. Sam, do you want to build on that? No, I, 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 talk before I keep answering questions. No, no, no. I'll, I'll just quickly comment on that. And then, yeah, let's definitely get to the questions. But I agree. I'm, I'm excited that, um, you know, we've been hearing for years that that research is so important and that now with the research center of SCA, um, you know, that there is a um, continued and, and more honed focus on that. And we are, you know, I, I think just recently looking at how do we continue to do research within um, various areas in coffee, but definitely uh, sustainability as well. And um, there, there have been some really interesting research proposal topics that, you know, we've been, we've been discussing. So I think there's some great opportunity there. And I do want to point out, I, I, the other thing that I think is interesting here is the SCA's role, I, I think, is also just part of the sector, right? So it's the specialty coffee sector. And, and again, this is where collaboration, I think, in reaching, reaching out is so important. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in my hotel room here at the NCA event, but there's, um, of course, to, to really, I think, make a, the change that's needed, we have to reach out to other p parts of the industry as well. Um, so I think that's the other thing we have to keep in mind is, the SCA also represents just a, a part of this overall industry that we are part of. Yeah, agreed. Um, so we're getting kind of a flood of questions, which is great. I'm thrilled great. about. I'm also I conscious that I'm probably not going to be able to answer them all in the time that remains. So. Um, one of the questions was about uh, whether the PowerPoint will be available, and uh, it will. This whole um, webinar will be available, uh, the recording of it. And also, um, I pulled these slides from a longer presentation that was created around the results of the um, of the survey, and uh, and you know wanted to do this webinar as an introduction to that survey. But um, but the survey is also something that we'll make available to uh, to members as sort of a piece of uh, of research. So all of this information will be accessible after the um, the webinar. And uh, I also wanted to say that in the last webinar that we did as a, a center, um, I committed to finding answers to all of the questions that we didn't get to on the um, on the call today or while we're still talking the rest of the hour. And I'll do that again. So if you have a question, um, please do type that in and I will make sure that we get it um, 
that I get an answer uh, to you or that we publish that on the SCA news site like we did for the profitability uh, webinar. Um, so uh, with that, the, um, the next question came from uh, Maria Ser Lopez saying, uh, or maybe it's not as a question so much as a, you know, a desire to have a more specific uh, specialty coffee sustainability definition so all of us can talk the same language. Um, saying informing our customers is our everyday job and it absolutely is. And this is, uh, you know, there are a few different things to address in there, but um, Sam, I'd love for you to, um, yeah. You know, to share any thoughts that you have on this uh, this call to uh, define specialty coffee sustainability, because um, you and I have talked about this before, and um, and I know that it's a it's a multifaceted. Uh, you probably have multiple opinions on it. Oh, depending on the day. Yeah. So uh, just uh, I'll answer quickly. So because um, I don't have a great answer. So um, I, I am torn on this. And, and Kim, you and I have talked about this. I, I agree that there is some benefit in coming up with a um, definition so that we are all speaking a common language. It allows for for um, conversation, I think, to start um, in a different place where people are on the same page. My challenge with it is, and if anyone has ever sat down to write their own definition of sustainability for their organization or maybe a personal definition, is it is hard to do in a way that does not leave something out. And I do think that there's something really important that when an organization or an individual is writing kind of their the definition of how they want to approach sustainability that is particularly material to their their place in the world and their place in the value chain and what they can impact. And so, you know, my, as an individual consultant, kind of a definition of sustainability that might be helpful might be very different than for, for a farmer in rural Uganda, right? So um, I, I don't have a great answer. I don't know. I mean, I definitely see some benefit in it, but I also um, am challenged to come up with a universal one because I do think there's something about organizations that are doing this work to come up with one that is represents the material reality of their place in the value chain and what they can do. Yeah, that's a great point about the, the need for that because of those different areas of, of influence and opportunity. And I also think about, um, you know, the, the sort of traditional um, membership of the Specialty Coffee Association or where it started. And, you know, it is growing so much internationally in um, regions that 20 years ago were not large consumers of specialty coffee like um, Korea. And in producing countries, more and more producers are seeing value in participating and, um, and, uh, and raising their voices and the profile of producers in general and uh, within the coffee industry. But um, I, I still do think that when the SCA, um, the the desire for the SCA to define sustainable specialty coffee or specialty coffee sustainability, I, I would really want the producer's voice or to think about who, who is defining it and um, and who we are as a, as definers and making sure that um, anything that we did was a, a more holistic or more um, producer driven. Uh, interpretation of sustainability than we have historically had. And I think that we're on that path, but we're not um, there yet. Uh, Maria Esther, I also wanted to um, ask you if you wanted to speak, because uh, I know that you raised your hand in addition to typing your comments. So um, we'll unmute you if you have anything that you'd like to say. Oh, no, I just wanted to ask a question and tell you that I really appreciate the efforts that SEA is doing every day in taking all this sustainability because there are a lot of people talking about it. Um, for people like, for instance, for me that I am in Latin America, I am in Argentina, uh, around here people are not talking about sustainability a lot. So see what is happening in the industry is really important for all of us. So. Mm, Nothing. I just wanted to say thank you for all that you're doing and all the research and keep doing it because we need that. We need to be informed and to uh, talk in the same path. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, moving down the question list, um, 
Joanne Sonnenschein notes that this could be, we there could be opportunities for brand agencies to collaborate and help members communicate to consumers. Um, so collaboration opportunities of sustainability challenges addressing service providers and collaborations uh, for consumers. And yeah, absolutely, that's, um, you know, there is a, there's a lot to do there and a lot that we, uh, a lot of expertise that we have access to um, that we might not have ourselves and maybe, you know, don't need to have because we have access to it. Um, so that's a, that sort of behavior change, um, I think, is, is something that more and more is uh, is coming up, not just around sustainability, but um, but definitely in this arena for um, for the specialty coffee industry. Um, Andrew Timko says, uh, where the expo is located is a choice about what's important. If agriculture is a focus or theme, then why not have the expo at a site that is a center for that type of thinking? St. Louis, for example, is the headquarters of Monsanto. Uh, despite their work, they attract an immense amount of ag tech research that can contribute directly to coffee. Um, yes, for sure. That's a, that's a great point. I mean, where expo is located, uh, thinking in a sustainability perspective is something that um, that is on my mind um, because of we measure factors like the uh, the carbon footprint and that can be influenced by the the energy grid in the city where the uh, the show is hosted also the the airlift you know how far people have to travel and what means of transportation they're using to get to the um to get to the event i mean uh, so there are definitely uh, many sort of sustainability considerations to be made with uh, citing expo or um or world of coffee and uh, in Europe or any of the events that we do, but um, m engaging the local community beyond coffee, I think, uh, or thinking not just in who's there for from a coffee perspective, but also um, what might we learn from uh, from these other non-coffee actors uh, is more and more. And Sam has talked about collaboration a couple of times, but the way that um, that we should be thinking. Uh, especially if we want to, yeah, if we want to, to tackle some of these or, or get new thinking on some of these seemingly intractable challenges. Um, yeah. uh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, just to add one thing on that, I, I, um, I, it's something I've become passionate about lately as well as the definitely looking for best practices and ways to address some of these challenges within the coffee industry, but. Um, Andrew, something you said just kind of sparked for me this this need to also look outside of the coffee industry, right? And and you know whether it's Monsanto and whatever you know, that you think of that organization, but I, I I think looking beyond coffee for ways to tackle some of this is is an area that many of us have not done enough of. You know that we are we are not alone and and. Um, uh, coffee farmers, for example, aren't just coffee farmers. You know, they're citizens of the world that that are um, also maybe uh, have other agricultural products. Or anyway, I think there's a lot of um, to be learned by looking at um, uh, adjacent sectors like maybe cocoa or tea, but also things that we would never think about. You know, so looking at um, I think some of the work going on in plant-based proteins and, and you know, some really innovative thinking on, on how are we going to meet the needs of future generations protein needs, you know, and anyway, so I, I do think there's some interesting work to be done there in um, reaching with um, non-traditional partners, you know, or unexpected collaborations uh, to, to address some of this. Yeah. Um, uh, Holly Sample makes a suggestion. How about the SCA communication? How about SCA communication toolkits to help members with messaging and promotion focused on sustainability? Um, I love that idea. Um, yeah, I, that's all I can say is I, I love that idea. I, um, and I love that uh, you know that that request is coming from you know hearing that request from uh, the membership or hearing that that would be useful. You know, some of the tools that we've created in the past have been um, created in response to a desire from a member or a group of, uh, within the membership saying, um, hey, we need more information on, uh, on this. And so, you know, we have a market research um, mandate and, and kind of wing of our research center. And, uh, and anytime we can, uh, that there's overlap when we are um, kind of using our uh, reach into the market and then combining that with, uh, with sustainability, I think that that's a, that's great. Um, Geronimo asks, how to explain that people are quite worried about climate change, 
but do not want the SEA to prioritize climate change, apart from not taking into account climate change as their concept of uh, sustainability? Um, yeah, I think you know, I think that's a that's a good question. I think if I'm interpreting it um, correctly, that uh, that yeah, what we are worried about, you know, or what we see as the greatest threat, and what we see as um, as what we can do immediately are not always the same. And I think that that tension is, um, you know, uh, well, I'll say that it could be that uh, that had we asked people again, we broke in this last question about the role in sustainability down. And been able to follow up with all those at 44 percent to say okay but what do you want us to in educate and inform customers and industry about then maybe climate change would have come up you know and uh, and it was only um people who used those words specifically that went into that category the 4.27 percent that that is associated with prioritizing uh uh climate change so um, anyway, it could be imperfection in the data collection <laughs> and question asking methods. But um, but regardless, I, I do think that like, um, you know, knowing that something is a, a big picture threat and feeling like you are um, capable of affecting change on that in your day to day life is uh, I think that that tension goes beyond the way that the survey was asked and the questions were asked. And it, it does reveal something about um, about coffee and about you know being a, an individual or a human who exists in this um within this complexity uh, i feel like that's a little bit meta as an answer going going really big picture but um that's the kind of um uh, but i i think that there's ongoing work to do to try to reconcile the big picture and the individual action sam do you want to add anything to this i feel like we should probably uh Probably wrap this up. We're at the hour. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Sam. You know, in particular, thank you so much for um, your insight here on this webinar, for all the work that you put into the analysis of the information. Thank you to everyone on the um, the webinar. I'm going to look at the camera. Now. <laughs> uh, thank you to all for for being here. Um, uh, as I said earlier, this will be made available on the SCA News um, site, and uh, and there will be future. There will be more webinars to come. Um, we did a farm profitability webinar uh, about a month ago, and we're planning the next one of those and webinars on other themes as well throughout the year. So I look forward to continuing this discussion with you. Um, and uh, yeah, so be well, everyone. Great. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, everyone. Bye.